Hi everyone, good afternoon, welcome to my channel. Um, today uh, I have great pleasure to welcome Grandmaster Zenek Ziska um, to talk about backgammon. Hi Zenek, how are you doing today? Hi Dan, I'm good, very good, thanks, happy to be here. Good, good. Uh, how's your day been? All well? <laughs> Oh, good. Just in just the morning now, so barely wake up. I woke up like two hours ago, so all good. <laughs> fresh, feeling fresh. Okay, great. So you all know uh, Zenek Ziska, uh, one of the greatest players in the world. You may have seen him uh, in the UBC, um, where he reached the final. So congratulations on that, Zenek. Uh, marvelous uh, performance. Uh, how did that? How did that feel for you? That kind of UBC journey yeah it felt very very relaxing as it was a week full of backgammon first three days we play i think 14 rounds so it was just very nice to get out and play after a long time uh i qualified without a problem so it was just more like a warm-up for quarterfinals upcoming quarterfinals semifinals and finals then and yeah it just felt good being out with friends you know discussing backgammon playing backgammon and yeah uh, everything worked out except the final where I made a one blunder. So yeah, cost me the match, cost me everything. But yeah, it was a stupid mistake. So it was a great experience. And uh, yeah, looking forward to see much versus Sander fight. That's going to be amazing. It's going to be uh, terrific. Yeah, later in the year. And uh, Galaxy is doing a, a great job, uh, you know, televising these matches. Um, so... Zenek, you're a great ambassador for Baggammon. You know, you you pass on your knowledge um, as a GM to help other players improve, which is which is admirable. Um, you recently started a channel, uh, Baggammon Coaching, where you post off position of the day, and there's other videos of you um, playing your fans, which is very enjoy enjoyable to watch. Um, why did you why did you start the channel up like what was the idea kind of behind that yeah this is this has been a project which i've been working on for a long time before i actually went public with it and it's actually something how i would like to help bagaman to grow so just started the website started the channel creating learning courses so i hope i mean and my goal is to make of course bagaman greater bigger and also explain it uh, not in a way which has been here like 20 years ago with those learning techniques, but come up with the modern cur curriculum, which basically will just help to will help people understand the game correctly from the right perspective. And they can be confident, confident about making moves and they don't just have to rely on description of the positions or like some rules on of backend because there are no rules in backend and so this is something of course what could work like 20 years ago but i mean now we all know that there is like a different perspective how you can look at things and it needs to be changed in from the thinking perspective point of view so i'm trying to pass this on to the people i'm creating besides youtube channel which is of course free and posting very learning uh, learning content there. I'm coming up and creating video courses. Uh, so far, I just published the intermediate course and it's like series of videos. Let's say every video has like 30 minutes and I talk about some topic or idea or anything from cube, checkers, opening moves, game ideas, game plans. And I just talk about everything so uh, I'm basically trying to like, if you go to school, if you go to university, this is going to be like a curriculum you would take, you know, first year intermediate, <laughs> second year advanced, third year world class, and maybe getting a bachelor degree or master degree or whatever. So just so you can master back then. And so this is what I'm trying to do. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Professor Ziska and his uh, backgammon uh, <laughs> curriculum. And uh, yeah, who better to teach, you know, um, obviously you can see many matches you've played online it's such a kind of low level of play and i think the course is great um and your videos because like you say it's about the foundation the 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 game plan the way of thinking um so rather than just looking at a, an assortment of positions you're actually kind of 
almost taken me back to a kind of uh, a perspective, a way of thinking about about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Which means you could look at any position and just apply your 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 thinking. And um, you released this book. Uh, was that last year, the Ziska Method? Yeah, uh, it's been published together with Galaxy. Uh, I've basically written it through Corona time because, well, what else to do than just, you know, staying home? What can you do? Playing back <laughs> and, Okay, well, it never gets boring even after a while. But um, yeah, just decided to write a book together with Galaxy and it just uh, was happy to do it and just enjoying it. I've had, I'm having it now. So yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah. it's, it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, it's a good it's a good book. Um, I'll put a link to it in the uh, in the chat um, to the video the video description, and you can buy it on the Galaxy Store. And one thing I really liked about it um, was, I, I guess what you call the Ziska method, which is kind of a story um, you tell yourself um, over the board. Um, you you kind of play the position forward and kind of look at the various outcomes. Uh, and I suppose that is your way of thinking, how you kind of have a, like a deeper appreciation of how the game unfolds. Uh, is that about right, what would you say? Uh, yeah, yeah, very, very good. Yeah, I mean, this is basically what could make sense, right? I mean, if you know what's going to happen or what's most likely going to happen, that means you understand the position, right? Because not much can surprise you, you know? So if you tell the right future, if you see it correctly, of course, through many tools and it takes experience and some process to learn it, how to do it correctly, you can always adjust. So if you know the future, then when not much can surprise you, then you can most likely make a good play. You know, you can connect the stories, see what story came up as a strong story and so on. So it basically gives you good guidance how to look at the game because until, well, let's say until not until now, but I find it not correct to look at the, just in a position, you know, to describe how the position looks. I mean, that's something what everybody sees, but it tells you nothing, right? But what's going to happen in the next role, what's actually happening in the position, that's what can actually tell you something. That's what can help you. So the only thing, basically, it sounds simple, right? The only thing you need to do is to correctly look at the position and see what's going on and most likely what's going to happen so you can make the best move. Wonderful. So that's what we're going to do uh, today in this uh, short video. Um, Zenek's going to talk us through a few positions um, and then we're going to look at the analysis afterwards. Um, so you can, of course, as a viewer, try to work out what, what you would do uh, with the role and then Zenek's going to apply his, his grandmaster storytelling uh, philosophy and to breaking them down. So I look forward to it. And like I said, it's a pleasure, Zenek, to have you here on the channel. Should we get started? Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, so position one, um, white to play a 6-1. Uh, and this is just a money game. Um, so over to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, in this 6-1 position, it can seem like we've got three options how to play, right? We can play from the 13, which would play 13 to 6. Then second option would be coming off the 20 point, 20 just all the way, or playing from the 23 point. Now, uh, about the story, you should always realize where the game is going, right? Because that's the way how you understand it. That's You should always expe expect something. So first thing what comes to my mind, I mean, if I was about to leave the 13 point and play like 13 to 6, What's going to happen? Well, okay, he can hit me most of the time. Once he hits me, I've just lost control of the outfield. I'm going to have difficulties to perform anything since, well, he's just going to control me. He's going to probably build a prime in front of me. And I've got just nothing to play with. So 13 to 6 doesn't really seem like a good way since he's just hitting. And I've got no way how to bring those five checkers home. So the only question here is, well, one more thing, this is not a bad game, yeah? So, I mean, the pip count is basically even. So even though we've got two anchors, we cannot really commit to bad game. So that's also like another reason why I would not play from the 13. I don't want to commit to a bad game. 
when the race is actually even. Um, so now just the decision between playing from a 20 point or 23 point. And it kinda, it's kind of going to have like a, the same future because, well, if we play from the 20, how different, I mean, what do we want to do next? Well, we need to move from the back, you know, because if we just move 2013, what's going to happen next throw? So, okay, we will still play from the 20, but still we will be stuck on the 23. Now, the game is happening in the outfield, right? Green is probably going to play with his block on the 14 point and then probably just playing from the back as well. And we want to take control of it. So the only thing I see is just playing 20 out of 23, just 23, 17, and then one doesn't matter. And by doing this, we've got a great control of the outfield. We don't care if opponent hits us because, well, we keep the five point anger, so we can always just enter. So we don't care about anything. We've got a great control of the game and we can just move forward. Everything else, we can't move really forward. We are trapped and yeah. So this would be the only story I would I'd be telling here. So there we are. So that's the analysis there um, on the left hand side. Anything else you would like to say about this one, Zenek, or should we move forward? Mm, just that you should always stick to your plan. You know, you should always realize the mindset. Theoretically, the position can change like from one row to another. So you should be always open to what you should do, what you could do. But here the idea is clear, you know, you just want to move from the back, have some checkers to play with, keep it kind of a holding game. But so, I mean, I, nine out of 10 times, this game will go. Uh, Green will play from, the, from, from his 14 point uh, and White will just move those two blocks around the board and it will be just normal holding game. So this is where to go. Everything else, you could get trapped and Green could take a very, very easy advantage. Great, fabulous. Let's move on to second position then. Um, so here again, um, White uh, to play 6-1 um, and the money game. So how would you uh, talk about this one? Yeah, this is, a, this is a really a good one. This also kind of belongs to chapter of risk reward of the very common concept I discuss a lot. I discuss it everywhere in the videos, in the course, in the book, everywhere. This is like the basic concept everybody should be familiar with, and that's risk reward. And also partly what's going to happen, of course. So what options do we really have? Well, if we play from the 24, um, there's kind of, I mean, 24, 18, 24, 23, we're just getting double hit. I mean, like so many times we're getting double hit or attacked. So we are unhappy. Like I would ask you, what would you hope for if you play 24, 18, 24, 23? Just what role would you hope for? What future would you hope for? What would you say? <laughs> uh, <laughs> double double five maybe <laughs> yeah 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 double five basically the only yeah. robot misses yeah. everything else you would be on the bar right mm -hmm. exactly this is how we can view the position everything else but double fives we will be on the bar we will not be in a good shape for sure mm -hmm. so kind of a second thing which i mean i can think about it but i will disregard very fast is something like eight to one like tempo hit right but well, if I get hit, I'm unhappy. If he rolls a five, I'm unhappy. If he dances, okay, I may be happy for like one roll, but I mean, nothing really changed. You know, he, it's not like he lost the game once he dances, you know. Okay, I made cover, but he's still in a big game. So it's like I can lose everything, but I will not get anything. So the real thing is, uh, I mean, the only other option is to play 13, 7, 6 to 5. And again, let's understand the future what's happening here. Uh, opponent is hitting us with 20 rolls, right? All fours, all ones. If he misses, we've got a huge game. We are probably making the five point and the game is just amazing. We, we will have a five prime or maybe six prime and we will be close to winning the game. So huge gain over there, huge improvement. 
If we get hit R3 by 13.765, of course, it's not good. If he hits us, of course, we are unhappy, but well, we've still got some backdoor chances. You know, we can enter the five, we can enter the two and have some good draws, which can create something else. So I would call this like as a huge gain and kind of a risk. I mean, our position already sucks a little bit. Yeah. So <laughs> we really need to do something when our position. Okay. I'm not going to use that word anymore, but, um, when our position is not good, we got a lot of a lot of room to improve, right? So that's why we can risk. And I mean, because our position was not good already, I mean, we can't really lose much anyway. So thirteen seven six two five going for the game, going for the big reward, should be the right idea here. There we are. Thirteen. Oh yeah, thirteen to six. I actually forgot to discuss, but I mean. 13 to 6 is kind of like doing nothing, yeah. I mean, you don't really have a big gain. It's just 13 6 doesn't really do anything, I would say, because well, if he rolls a 4, you're still unhappy because he's probably going to jump out. So there's not really a big upside if you just play 13 6. So I would not play that move. So uh, it's interesting, this one, because when Dirk was on the channel recently, um, mm -hmm. he talked about how kind of intermediate players or newer players, they, they're more afraid to kind of make slotting plays like this. Um, mm -hmm. They're more kind of fearsome <laughs> over the board. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of what advice would you have for people just to be a bit more bold, you know, over the board? Um, how, do people, mm -hmm. how do people become more kind of risk averse or, or more <laughs> risk taking? Um, well, the, the people who, who are playing backgammon should realize that in backgammon you just have to take risks. You know, you have to take well calculated risks, and you just cannot play safe all the time. Because once you play, I mean, sometimes if you play safe, it's actually more dangerous to uh, than just risking it right away. You know, like if you play just too safe with no bloods, you will always end up in a very bad position, in a sticky position with no board, with nothing created. And then it's going to become more dangerous because the one who's taking the risks, the ones who's slotting points, building points, playing pure, how they say, where that's the opponent who's ending up with a good board, with a good position, and then usually hitting the opponent and then winning. So, well, um, I guess I would just say always realize how much you are risking, how much you are gaining by slotting and this you just gain so much and mm -hmm. i mean okay so what so he hits us we enter and we are still in the game so not much happened anyway yeah a small risk for a large gain and that ties into your futures you know looking forward um rather than ended up um how a safe play might like you said result in a in an even worse position where, yeah. you, where you leave more <laughs> shots Okay, let's look at his final position then. Again, it's a 6-1. White to play. Um, the cube um, has been turned. Uh, green owns a cube. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Where do all positions 6-1? I feel like everything was 6-1, wasn't it? <laughs> I it tried to hand the kind of pattern to, to them. 6-1. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, well, um, this is actually something. So this is actually a theme which I'm currently recording a course on. This is called Failed Closeouts. And this is this position got a very clear idea. Open and is on the bar. So our goal is to bring checkers home as soon as possible. So what's our biggest problem? Well, I probably move the 20 point to the well. I mean, well, one thing, one good thing here is that open and got two blocks, right? So what would really hit us? Yeah, the future. Can he really hit us with 4-1? Can he really hit us with 4 2, 4 3, 4 5, 4 6? He can't really hit us. I mean, he will if he rolls that, but it's, the point is, we don't care. So if we play like 10 to 9 and then 20 14 because there's no other 6, then we maximize our chances to make a point, right? That's our main goal to make that point. Two main goals to close the four point and at the same time bring checkers home. So if we play 2014, 10 to nine, we don't care that we've got so many blocks because if he hits us with four or five, well, we're just gonna hit him back. 
So we don't care about it at all. But we are maximizing our chances to make the four point. So in that sense, I just go for the maximizing playing 2014, 10 to 9 in this case. If opponent got three point and two point made, then I would accomplish the same thing with just playing 13, 6, which would maximize my chances to make the four point compared to the risk that I would not risk anything. And yeah, at the same time, I want to still build the four point. I think the intermediate mistake here would be just making the 13 point. That's a very, very wrong idea here. And well, then you're just unhappy if open and draws a four and you are facing a bigger problem. So this is part of what we've been talking about in the last position, actually, that now it may seem like it's a safer play, but actually it's <laughs> way more dangerous to make the 13 point than it seems like, because what's the future? Well, you have to get out of the 13 point, right? You need to move it. So of course you need to leave the blood there. You just, if you keep it, open and draws four, three, well, you got a huge problem to clear the 13 points suddenly. If you play 2014, 10 to nine, or just 13, six, well, you've got nothing to clear. You are happy. You are, you're okay. So yeah, so just 2014, 10 to nine for those reasons mentioned. So there we have it, yes. Um, five blots though strewn in the outfield. It looks it looks scary, but of course, you know, you're right. You have to take advantage of green being on the bar and also they don't have any home board, do they? Um, yeah, exactly. And this is, this, is, this is why I wouldn't like the descriptive point of view. If let's say you would play doubles or I would play doubles. And somebody would tell me that he doesn't want to do this play because it leaves five blocks. Like, what does it mean? What it what it says? I mean, is there some kind of rule that I cannot have five blocks on the board? <laughs> I mean, I know he's not hitting me. If he hits me, I don't care. So, so this is something why the future makes sense. Why I'm just all against the description point of idea and point of view and just looking into the future a lot. So, yeah. And it, it's a good exercise in shot counting as well. Like you said, even if your opponent rolls a four five, like so what? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, it, yeah exactly. It, it's not true. <laughs> the only the only devastating roll is probably a a double four, I guess. Which yeah, would, yeah. Uh, but as we can see, double four is just bad, anyways. Yeah, I mean, whatever we play, I mean, there is no way we are playing eight to two. So I mean, whatever we play. Uh, double four is just something we cannot do anything about it. I mean, if open and draws double fours and wins the game, I would just say good match. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just move on. You know? <laughs> just... <laughs> Shake their hand begrudgingly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, of course not. Um, really interesting. I, I, I think it's fascinating your approach and how you're able to articulate those, those ideas. And it, a lot of it seems almost like common sense. <laughs> um, you know, that's a great thing, isn't it? Um, but o of course, over the board, I mean, how many people would just make a 13 point here? And like you said, yeah, yeah. then end up with a difficult kind of like, how do, I, how do I clear that point when green enters and so on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the, that's the problem then, because then if somebody is just making automatically a 13 point, it really says that understanding of the position is not good here you know we so i'm trying to basically uh, teach people how to understand positions how to always be aware of what's going on because once you are always being aware of what's going on then you can i mean most of the time you can find the best play you can even be aware of some tricky plays you know because suddenly you you of course heard about so many moves which like people say oh my god no human would find this right but actually well, once you think about it, once you see the position correctly, it's some, of course, sometimes it's super difficult, but sometimes it just makes the right sense, you know, because the future is right. And this is what computer sees. And this is why I'm so happy to be using it. And just always good to see the right, the right <laughs> move and just understanding the position a little bit more. Um, great. I mean, what, what other advice would you have for improving players Zenek, what do you think is like really, really key 
you know, when you when you maybe you've been playing backgammon for a couple of years, maybe casually, you're looking to take it to the next level. So what what sort of things should people be, be kind of considering? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, yeah, I understand. Uh, well, there are two things, actually, I'm going to make a little advertisement here because I always say you should, I mean, individually, I mean, it depends, bag, I mean, it's so much about working individually. So it's so important to find what the person needs. I mean, for example, when I'm teaching, I, I'm looking at the board differently with a player who, let's say, doesn't like math too much. On the other hand, when person likes math a lot, then I'm looking at it differently. So it's just about tendencies. What Dirk is a big master of tendencies, understanding them. Where is your problem? And just see what you do the most and try to work on that. Of course, with the right ideas and the right help. So sometimes I feel like, of course, some this is this is the thing where either you can ask a person to teach you, of course, that's why there are teachers all over the world. Or if you can do it alone, it can be harder. Yeah, but it's of course always easier to ask somebody, ask a professional or ask a friend who's better than you to to help you to identify some 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 of your tendencies and bad moves. So always that. For example, what if the player is missing too much cube, right? Let's say you are playing in a club and you are playing against your friend and you know that your friend never cubes. Yeah, you always cubes too late. It's always difficult for a person himself to see it. But so this is why it's so important and so nice. I mean, it feels so nice to always work with friends, work with groups. And it's always, I mean, Bagam is a great thing to connect with people, talk about something. And yeah, so either alone, which may, you may find difficult, or let somebody uh, analyze your game, talk about it, and, and so on, yeah. And I'm sure people would like to know, Zenik, you, you're playing at like a sub three PR, which is just incredible. You know, it's extraordinary to watch. How, how do you prepare? You know, how did you prepare for the UBC? Like, what do you do for your own game? Yeah, uh, I actually liked so much what Sanders said in the interview. And it's like, I don't care about the PR. I just liked playing good backhand. That's what he said. And that's like, something what I just like to do as well. Uh, just, I mean, PR is just a number, right? I mean, the <laughs> understanding of the game is the real thing. But of course, you ask differently about like how you can prepare the best. And that's just really good analysis of your games and just trying to prepare even the topics, you know, kind of this, those tendencies we talked about. So just looking at your tendencies, what you can, what you're doing too much, what you shouldn't, so I've been preparing that I just played a lot of matches. I've been saving some of my ideas, which I wanted myself to review. So I've saved, let's say, hundreds of pictures. So I just went through them, one second, one position, just, okay, I've got it in my mind. And then just move on and yeah, worked do out you, almost perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any uh, pre-match rituals? I know Will, he talks about like breathing exercises or, do you do do you do anything like that? Go for a run or you know drink water? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for a while I have not been doing that, but the reason that I've started, of course, focusing on a big match is important. I mean, if I go to a tournament, uh, okay, if it's a first round, second round, I mean, usually the schedule is like you just have to play a match, next match in two hours, next match in one hour. So not much there to play, prepare on some casual matches, of course. Preparing to a tournament is important and it's important to focus on the match, be, I guess, a little bit calm, whatever, but you just want to have fun, be relaxed and have a good mindset. Regarding more important matches and let's say semifinals, finals, that's where you just should go to bed early. Don't party too much, don't drink too much. <laughs> that's a big mistake, I guess. And yeah, just uh, relax and good breathing and everything like that. And, and after you've played the match, um, do you do kind of a lot of post-match analysis? Uh, do you kind of play around with positions on XG and stuff like that? Oh, yeah, a lot, yeah, a lot. Especially in the UBC, I just try to review always the match after I finished it, after I played it, just to see 
I mean, what was going on, what happened, what mistake did I make? Uh, yeah, so that for sure is, I mean, that's the biggest part of, of backgammon learning, right? To analyze your matches and your mistakes properly, just so you make sure you understand the game. So especially in the UBC, where the PR mattered, where the skill mattered a lot, that's where it's even way more important than in just a normal tournament, I guess, yeah. Uh, wonderful. And I just have one more question. I'm really uh, curious, and I'm sure my audience is, I know mm -hmm. you were close to Falafel, um, a wonderful person, a wonderful player. Um, uh, and he, you know, he, he taught you, right, um, about backgammon. I mean, mm -hmm. how, I mean, how was that experience? Oh, he was just the best, amaz most amazing person in backgammon. And it's just, I mean, in Istanbul, there was a huge poster of him and mm -hmm. it was just so nice. He was the best. He was amazing. And just seeing him and listening to him speak about Bagam and talking about Bagam, that was, I mean, I would much, ra much rather to just listen to him than go to the cinema or something to watch a movie. Mm -hmm. It was entertaining, exciting, all made sense. These ideas, these futures, like he all, always had an idea how, how to look at a position and that was just the key and yeah it was just such a big unfortunate but yeah all people loved him i still love him so much and miss him a lot yeah so yeah, yeah definitely thank you so much uh Zenek, um, for coming onto my channel um i i love your enthusiasm for the game and your philosophy is is terrific um but, but you know it is a game and we have to enjoy it and i think a lot yes. of what you've said is just just enjoy it don't get hung up on your pr constantly just have fun you know you're playing with friends talk about it and like you said part of the joy is just having a conversation yes. about backgammon and and that came across with with dirk and will um the social aspect um, mm -hmm. of it um yeah. Would you like to add anything else <laughs> before? No, we... no, but you're right. It's just the most fun just to play shuet, you know, be with friends, discuss position and yeah, just have fun, have a drink and that's the best. Yeah. So enjoy whatever you're doing and forget about the PR. It's like... <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> well, uh, please check out uh, Zenex channel, um, Backgammon Coaching and his book, The Ziska Method. And um, please like and subscribe to my own channel as well, please, uh, if you enjoy the content. Thank you so much, Zenek. Uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you and uh, all the best uh, in your backgammon future. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Dan, and to you too. Thank you very much. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. See you. Bye.